Well, welcome to the tape on Hegel and Marx, different dialectics. Here we're down in an arroyo. It's raining. The water has cut into this arroyo century after century. And we're, we have a little bit of rain. You can see a steady stream in another month. We won't have much water, I'll be dry, bone dry here. You can look on the bank here and see where it's cut into the bank and it's been somewhat higher levels than it is today. But it's quite amazing how, how this works in nature. So today, we're talking about Hegel and we're talking about Marx, Karl Marx, and Frederick Engels. And I want to talk to you about how Hegel had a dialectic where the spirit was the crown of science. So science and the spirit worked together to create reason, and over time, the spirit was able to manifest itself in spiritual materialism. It started out with Hegel saying, hey, you start out with an abstract sense of what's going on in your science, and you start out with an abstract spirit because nobody believes in spirit anymore, and then you graduate into reason through the dialectic process by the negation of negation. Now, Hegel had two dialectics. One was synthesis, thesis, kind of dialectic. Thesis, antithesis, the opposition leading to synthesis. But there was a second dialectic called the negation of negation, in which both thesis and antithesis had contraries, contradictions that emerged in surfaces, one blaming the other, the other saying, hey, you're no better than we are, but boom, ba boom, ba boom. And in the negation of the negation, they never really reached synthesis. So let's look at Marx. What Marx does is says, I'm not going to have this idea of the spirit. Instead, I'm going to redefine the spirit as a fetish. The fetish that consumers have towards commodity, where they'll pay more for a Nike sneaker than for a Kmart sneaker or Target sneaker that doesn't have the label on it. And by the way, Kmart just closed here. With four Walmarts in town, it could no longer compete. I expect Target will go next. And Marx talks about this phenomenon of the fetish. And his other big contribution, there are many, but the one we'll talk about is called surplus. S-U-R-P-L-U-S, I got it scrawled in the ground here. And here we have a dialectic. I was telling you about the four waves as we moved from Hegel when it was kind of the farm, ranch, village, craftsmen, people living in their families, not really moving far from home, bit of travel, but not far. And then when you get to the Industrial Revolution that Marx is writing about, there's a new dialectic, and it continues into the post-industrial. But this dialectic I want to talk about is between Marxism and Taylorism, Faolism, Weberism, or the TFW virus, as Henri Saval likes to call it. And I introduced that a little bit to you. So what I think happened is both Marx and the TFW people figured out Marx's surplus value. That if you have a way of downsizing the number of employees, paying them less and less money, engineering the processes so that they're centrally planned in Taylorism, the factory process, centrally administered in Faolism, and the centralized bureaucracy with its rules etc., divisions of labor in Fayol and in Weber, and 
these principles that they all had are really just other ways of getting at surplus value. Now the water's beginning to rush here. I don't want you to get scared, but uh, if there's a sudden downpour, this whole valley could fill with water in a few seconds. So let's speed it along here. So that's what I want to talk about is that Marx solved the surplus value. The capital is always extracting surplus value by figuring out a way to dumb down the tasks, centralize them, automate them, uh, put them in the hands of planning clerks, and he also foresaw that not only would the factory floor, Taylorism, go through this labor process, as he calls it, but the administrators would go through this labor process and the whole bureaucracy would go through this labor process and the whole thing would just get dumber and dumber and dumber as a system. And it would dumb down to the point where all the functionaries could get less pay, you could hire in more and more part-timers, you could just decrease it and decrease it. So I want to look at another dialectic here next week, which is how the DFW virus was opposed by Mary Parker Follett. She had a different view of scientific management than Taylor, a different view of administrative management than Fayol, and a different view of bureaucracy than Mr. Vab Max Weber. And what she thought you could do is create what Grace Ann Rosil and I call an ensemble of leadership where the situation is the leader and you have power with other people in relationships instead of power over. And Mary Parker Follett is the founding woman of systems theory. She's the forgotten hero as we look at Marx, Taylor, Fayol, Weber, and in World War II they tried to convince us that open systems was created uh, by von or talent fee, which is a set of bunk, because Mary Parker Follett was a pragmatist working in Boston with the likes of John Dewey, William James, Charles Saunders Peirce, and as a pragmatist and feminist, she knew that we had to do something about democracy in organizations and in politics, and she really wanted to bring an understanding that the system is open to its environment. Here we're in an environment that is constantly adapting and changing. And the system is also creating and changing that environment. So it's a mutual co-creative process. We'll talk about that next week with Mary Parker Follett. This is David Boji. Go to our website, davidboji.com slash 655 for the advanced systems or if you want to just know how to change a system go to davidboji.com slash 448 thank you very much